Hi everyone, my name is Michelle, and on a good day, I feel like 60% of who I used to be. And that's because a year ago today, um, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. In the first few months of being diagnosed, I was constantly looking for information about what it was like to live with this. I was looking, um, I was desperately looking for information, but more importantly, I was looking for support for people to walk with me in this, who understood what I was going through. And so I joined Facebook groups and Reddit communities. I was constantly reading WebMD and other people's blog posts. And through my research, I found that there is no cure for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is a chronic illness, and so it's purely symptom management. But I have hope. I have hope that one day I can be 100% me again. And so when I met Jason and the rest of the Edenos team, I knew that Edenos could change everything for patients living with chronic illness. So what is Edenos? Edenos is a platform for patients living with chronic disease to form communities with each other and to share with what we call treatment journeys. Um, and so with this user input and with machine learning, we're able to then connect these patients with potential clinical trials that are looking for patients like them. Patients are constantly looking for new and better treatments, um, especially when, for at least for me, no treatments seem to be working. And then biotech companies are looking for those very patients to join and stay in their clinical trials, which is a huge struggle, which Jason will talk about right now. So clinical trials is just a, is a tremendous moniker. Over 60% of clinical trials don't meet their enrollment timelines. And each day beyond that, biotech companies stand to lose millions of potential revenue. But more importantly, it hinders progress in scientific advancement for life-improving treatments. So we analyzed this problem and found out that there's three folds, discovery, enrollment, and engagement. Over 85% of patients have indicated that they were unaware of potential clinical trial opportunities when they were diagnosed with their condition. 75% of them had stated that they're quite open to participating in one if they knew that it was an option. 48% of clinical trials under-enroll patients into their clinical trials. And confounding factors include these long lists of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And on top of that, collecting patient data can be very challenging and costly. Even after a patient joins a clinical trial, 30% of them drop out. And this is due to difficulty in following up with the pa patients and also lack of investigational product adherence. So with all these factors, the clinical trial recruitment problem is not only very difficult, but it is also increasing at a tremendous rate because the number of clinical trials has been accelerating. In 2013, there are 137,000 clinical trials, and today, there are about 300,000. This equates to a market of around 6.25 billion in just patient recruitment alone. With a big market, we also have a lot of competitors. But only Edenos solves all aspects of clinical trial recruitment. Health information sharing sites like WebMD and Mayo Clinic provide quality vetted health content and also have brand recognition, but they don't focus on clinical trial recruitment. So we actually see them more as a partner where we could source their content, generate more traction on our sites, and provide our trial recruitment services. Online community platforms like Patients Like Me or Inspire have huge patient population databases but then they only list out these clinical trials and don't mine the data in order to, to allow them to find the perfect match. Lastly, patient recruitment services have the capacity to create campaign models for these clinical trials and they share it with all these other platforms in order to recruit for patients. In fact, some of them even mine electronic health record data in order to find the best match. However, many of them don't own their own platform, and as a result, they lose out on continual engagement with the patient, resulting in poor patient retention after joining the clinical trial. 
Edenos does something that no other competitor does. We leverage our treatment journey feature that allows patients to document their treatment experiences. We mine that data in order to create the perfect match with these clinical trials and follow them throughout the entire clinical trial journey. So let me welcome you to Edenos. So this is a demo of our carpal tunnel community where you could view all the different treatments for carpal tunnel and filter it based on treatment categories. You could view the descriptions of each of the treatments and even all the crowdsourced effectiveness ratings. If you find an interest in using one of these products, you could start your own treatment journey, log about your own experiences, and track your symptom improvement over time as you interact with others using the product. With all that textual data, we can use natural language processing to create topics and also association vectors in conjunction with the answers to the inclusion and exclusion criteria that we ask our users. We can use our machine learning algorithms to create clinical trial match percentages that we can further connect these patients to these trial sites. So in a nutshell, Edenos has two main stakeholders, the users and the biotech companies. For users, they're drawn to our platform because they're able to find community with other patients like them, and they can share information with each other about doctors who they liked, um, symptoms that they have, and treatments that are working for them. And so for the biotech companies, our value to them is that we can help them e efficiently recruit and retain patients in their clinical trials. So in terms of our business model, our platform will always be free for the patient users. We will generate our revenue from the biotech companies as the patient progresses through the clinical trial journey. For pre-screening, we'll charge $50. Once they go to the clinical trial site, another $100. And when they finally enroll, $500. Because we can continually keep the patient engaged and retain the site, we plan to continually charge $100 per month the patient is retained. Currently, our pre-screening pricing is lower than industry standards of around $200. Um, and this is because we have a centralized platform where we can screen the patients in a more cost-effective manner. And on top of that, by getting patients into our system and also clinical trial, we can, can follow the patient through and charge a premium once they enroll into, into a clinical trial, and a premium when we continually engage them. We believe that this business model makes sense because biotech companies have more of an opportunity cost after the patient has enrolled in the clinical trial, which is estimated to be $36,000. So a back-end heavy model is more financially savvy for these biotech companies to tap into. We believe that we can make this venture possible because of our diverse team with complementary skill sets. I'm Jason, a MD, MBA student here at UCLA with an understanding of patient needs to grow our platform and on top of that, connections to health experts and also clinical trials. But back is a UCLA CS PhD candidate specializing in machine learning um, who can optimize our clinical trial matching algorithms. Peter is a full stack developer who can rapidly program different features onto our platform in response to patient needs. With our medical advisors at UCLA, St. John's, and Stanford, we have access to our initial clinical trial opportunities. On the other hand, in order to target our initial patient population, we plan to start with the Charcot Marie II community, um, because also known as CMT, because it is a very rare and underserved community with a lot of clinical trial activity. And by targeting a more niche market, we have less competition, allowing us to establish a stronger beachhead and a stronger foothold in capturing the majority of the market. We've already reached out to multiple people in, in these disease-specific Facebook groups and enlisted nine beta testers for our app um, that we will launch to the Charcot Marie Tooth population this month. 
And we've also been in contact with the Charcoal Marine Tooth Association Foundation. The chairman has, who is a friend of our mentor, has expressed interest in sharing the app with the, the members of his foundation. After we gain users onto our, our app, we'll continually keep them engaged with emails and push notifications. In terms of our financials, with revenue from pre-screening, enrollment, and, and retention, we plan to break even at year three, and, and we plan to have a cost of around 500,000 our first year, um, which we will raise with our first rounds of funding. And so with the prize money, we intend to help, um, we intend to roll out the beta testing to the CMT patients and to continue developing our app for um, widespread distribution very soon thereafter. And so with your support, EDNOS can help um, people like me, um, help, pe help patients find better treatments, help patients connect into um, clinical trials, and ultimately connect people when they need it the most. Thank you. Uh, partnering with organizations like Mayo or WebMD, which are very large today, uh, been around a long time and have put a lot of money into it. Have you had those discussions? Have you started talking to them about it? Yes, we did start our negotiation with Evix and Mayo Clinic. We did negotiate for a three, six months trial with Evix already. And after that, it's going to be 30K each month. And Medline and Quest also have some uncopyrighted contents we can use for free. And in our earlier stage of the business, we might want to take advantage of that as well. Okay. I'm sorry, what's your role with the company? Um, I am a law student here and in this business, um, my job is to um, connect, c contact healthcare information providers and seek cooperation with them to, to seek permission to use your contents. Mm -hmm. and, and Tony, what's been your involvement? Uh, so my involvement has been uh, planning out the business plan, uh, entry, uh, market entry strategy, as well as uh, research on legal issues that may affect the company. Mm -hmm. So the key thing is, is you're building up community. Um, and I'm just trying to get an assessment there's a lot of different communities on the web today uh, that share experiences and so on. Why do you feel you're going to be successful in that regard? Do you think that there's that the, the opportunity today of these communities is, is really deficient for people with chronic diseases? And so I can share a little bit personally because yeah. I am a part of all these um, different Hashimoto's groups. I think I'm in part of like four or five different endocrine um, disease groups on Facebook. And just the kinds of content that people share, it's very personal, but it's super uncategorized. Like I have to go through the feed and kind of figure out which information is important to me and figure out who, like which kinds of users I'm best matched with. And so what Edenos is trying to do is trying to categorize that information so users can find it quickly um, and that it's categorized and that it also, we plan on matching um, other users and suggesting to them other users that are more like them, where they are at in their illness or in their treatments. Mm -hmm. So this proof point, have, what, what experience have you had that tells you that that's going to be successful? Is it just, is it your experience? No, so we've looked into 12 disease states and the reason why we chose Charcot Marie Tooth is because of its morbidity and its rarity and the number of clinical trials available. We also looked into the number of treatments that are available for, for these patients with chronic diseases and also the number of health experts that these patients need to tap into in order to live their best lives possible. Because the more treatments that they use and the more health experts means more content that they will continually post. And in terms of the rarity, the reason why we're choosing more niche markets is because they're underserved and they're desperate to find more, more solutions. And on top of that, these big organizations want to focus more on where there are more, 
more patients where, where they can generate more revenue. Well, but that also goes to the clinical trials. These orphan diseases, there just aren't as many clinical trials because usually the big farmer is interested where the maximum number of patients, just like you said. Right, and that's absolutely correct. And with orphan diseases, the government actually has expedited processes for FDA approval. And so by allowing us to get a foothold in these orphan diseases, hopefully in the future we can even expand to all the other. So when I, when I was looking, so you look like you peak negative cash flow, I don't know, about a billion, a million four or something like that, when I was looking at your statement here. Uh -huh. I don't know about that. Oh, but. yeah, we, 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 mo we improved it oh, after we okay. got the feedback oh, okay. from our judges. But, okay. but love to hear your question. Well, no, I was just looking at page 28 of your thing. Uh -huh. It looks like it was a, a million four where you peaked negative. Yeah. Negative. So you showed this chart, so it's very different. So mm -hmm. now, okay. Yeah, the, the discrepancy is that we were assuming we were only tackling charcoal marine suit population within the first five years. We're just simplifying the model, but over here we actually expand to to, 12. to, um, to two the second year with carpal tunnel, and then by year three we expand to five, and then and then to, to all twelve by year, by year five. five. That's right. Okay. So and, no, can we talk a little bit about how you how you target your your patients your patient population a little bit more? Because I think I probably have the same concern. Uh, that you've heard is the smaller the audience that you're targeting, generally the harder it is and the more expensive it is to target. Mm -hmm. And if this audience is already engaging with either social platforms like Facebook and they have groups there, or they're getting content on WebMD, right. how are you pulling those <coughs> audiences onto your platform? Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm just not getting the, you go from having the group on Facebook or having the content on WebMD do you license content from WebMD or somebody else and put it on your platform and that pulls the patients to you? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So this novel, this licensed content won't pull users onto our platform. That is just to keep the users engaged on our platform. But what truly pulls new users onto our platform is novel user experience content, which our users will be generating with their treatment journeys. And as they document their experiences with these treatments or their symptom improvement, they can actually share their journey with other social media platforms like Facebook, Reddit, Quora. Okay, so you're having essentially, so you have uh, user-generated content that you're then pushing back out into social channels to drive other similar users back to your platform. That's absolutely right. Okay, that makes a little bit of sense, but you gotta get that wheel turning first, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a really small audience you're targeting, as you do with some of these orphan diseases, uh, do you have any concept of what your acquisition cost is for those initial users? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So we actually also looked into AdWord and like Google, Facebook advertising, but I think given that we're bootstrapping this entire startup, it's very important to keep our <coughs> costs low. And so we believe that organically is the most appropriate growth for our first year projections in terms of by allowing our initial beta testers to create these journeys, we can focus on sharing these on other social media avenues. And then by year three, we factored in the cost for a, a click rate of around 1% at a 0.3 cents per click cost for Facebook and and. Google AdWords, um, and that equates to around a user acquisition cost of around $40, $50. So an unsolicited piece of advice, one of the things you may want to think about doing is taking some of the unstructured content you were talking about before, pulling it into your platform if you're permitted to do so, and structuring it in a way that it would be much more useful to your users, um, because then when you're trying to drive this sort of virtuous cycle of UGC turns into more users. Right. There's actually something there for your users to interact with and it's not the first visit they read the one story and then they're gone. Yes, so, so you hit the nail right on the head because all this content, even their improvement and their symptoms is quality health information for, for the users on the platform. So our next, next feature that we're currently building 
are graphs that allow users to see improvements over time. And because we have all the individual user data for a specific treatment, we could actually display at what day of usage of that particular treatment does symptoms improve the most as, they, as, as new users are interested in trying out these treatments. Are you the founder? Yeah. And, how did and you co founder. I have two other, two other co founders as well. Where are they? Um, so, so they couldn't make it today. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a, a quick question? Just about um, anytime I see this this kind of stuff, I get a, that little like privacy thing in the back of my head that starts <coughs> to like make me break out in hives. So, how are you thinking about that? Because um, I'm sure you haven't missed all the sort of backlash against tech companies who are not being responsible with people's data, and especially this kind of data, which is the most sensitive possible data that you can be collecting about people. Um, is this HIPAA compliant? Like, how are you thinking about security? Like, what happens if I want to take my data off because I changed my mind and I decided I didn't want to tell these people that I had this yeah. disease? Like, how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so, yeah. so uh, with regard to uh, the data privacy question, uh, we will be taking industry standard protection. For instance, uh, we will be using SSL, which is uh, secured socket layering, which provides an encryption link between the web browser <coughs> and our servers. And we also have will be having access controls on who can actually be using or looking at the data. For instance, we wouldn't have someone that is not actually directly using the data or working with it to be able to look at it. And we will also have, um, as well as other administrative safeguards, uh, such as we will have HIPAA compliant training for the employees. And for HIPAA, uh, we will be compliant to that uh, because of technical safeguards, administrative safeguards, as well as a physical safeguard, so we won't let people who shouldn't be in the room enter the physical location of these rooms. And you've also touched on uh, privacy issues of that might, for instance, GDPR. And the, well, the first thing is we will try to mitigate the effects of that because we, our first, our primary market will be in the US. But should we have users who are in Europe, uh, we will also be compliant to GDPR because we are considered data processor, and uh, what they require of us is that we will have explicit consent from the users, and we'll be using it for uh, scientific, historic, or public interest purposes. And here it would be, we would, from our end user agreement, we would try to get explicit consent, and we will also be using it to advance medical research in that sense that fulfills the public interest requirements. Thank you.